Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Bill Wilson. I'm Director of Central Facilities at the MRL. And I think I've gotten this job because I'm the designated campus football fan. <laughs> because everybody knows I'm a Philadelphia Eagles season ticket holder. Don't cry about that. I do sometimes. Um, I, I, and I actually uh, here are very proud to be here, especially for this talk, because I was a high school football player, but what happened was I stopped growing tall and started growing wide, and so my football <laughs> career was over. Um, but I remember waking up on Saturday mornings with my head ringing and my ears ringing. Um, and as for all those of you who's, who watch football today, I'm sure you realize that concussions have become front and center in what's going on in the league. And so I was pointing out a little earlier to a few people that in terms of the size of players over the, the last few years, Mike Webster, who was the center for the Steelers dynasty in the 70s, was actually not much bigger than me. He was 6'3", 255 pounds, and he was a Hall of Fame player. To play that same position in the NFL today, he'd have to gain 100 pounds. Uh, the other thing that I also noticed that, that, I, that I pulled out as a statistic this morning, which I thought was one of the most intriguing ones, is that over the last 60 years, the average weight of football players has gone up on average one and a half to two pounds per year for 60 years. And so God knows the equipment has not caught up. And I think finally that we're getting to the point now in terms of monitoring concussions and starting to pay attention to the, both the physiology of concussions, uh, the medicine around them. And I now think people are now also starting to look seriously about the structural engineering and the engineering integrity of the equipment the players use. And so I look at these guys and I say, you guys are going to save the sport I love. <laughs> and so I wish you well. And so our two speakers today are Azai Kazvinsky, uh, who managed to sandwich around an undergraduate degree in environmental science and public policy and an MBA at Harvard University, sandwiched that around his career uh, playing for the Seattle Seahawks. And Kevin Jackson, who is, from what I can tell, an alumni from Illinois, Illinois born and bred, undergraduate degree here in animal science, PhD here in animal science, and he managed to sandwich that around a career being a running back for the Illini. And they're going to both talk to you about the work that they're doing, both at MC10 and also here on campus, uh, exploring optimizing safety and performance in sports, uh, diagnostics, and therapeutics for head impacts. And so I'll let you guys have the floor. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, can you, everybody hear me? Hear me well? It's an honor to be here. I want to thank everyone for, uh, for showing up. I want to I thank John for, for having me out and uh, been able to develop a pretty close relationship with Kevin, uh, working with him uh, on some potential uh, avenues uh, as it relates to some of the te technology we're developing. Uh, just kind of start out with, uh, before I start the talk, I'm, I'm not going to keep this too long, I'm hopefully going to be interesting, and want to uh, really focus on my background and then as my background as it relates to uh, what I'm doing now at, at MC10 and um, how, that, how that relates and to, to a need to gather more data and why, so just not gathering data for no reason, but being able to, to use that in, in a way that's actionable and uh, defined. And um, as we all know, as you, as you guys know, putting parameters around um, what is meaningful and what is not is, is at the core of that. So um, I want to start out giving a little, little background on myself, and we'll talk about it a little. I grew up in, in upstate New York, uh, youngest of five kids. Um, grew up in poverty. It didn't have much, and um, you know something that you is important about me and kind of my pathway to to lead me where I'm at in front of you guys right now is uh, you know my large parts of my childhood I didn't have a father figure I didn't have anything to look up to uh, I didn't have anybody to guide me through life and uh, I found football at age nine and was able to teach me things that no one else could have, have ever te taught me and um, you know the, the the pieces of uh, you know that, that I look back on my life to, to where I'm at now, the pieces around hard work, hard work and perseverance, and 
um, being able to deal with adversity day in and day out were something that are core to me and uh, core to why I, I love sports and core to why I want to see a, a game like football survive and, and continue to thrive. Um, so from that, from that background, I was able to um, go through four years at Harvard. I was, I was a pre-med undergrad, I, I finished that. I was drafted by the fourth round by the Seattle Seahawks in, uh, in 2000, which feels like forever ago. <laughs> I feel like old even saying that. Um, and uh, ended up being the highest, highest draft pick out, out of Harvard history. I was a linebacker. So for those of you that don't know football too well, I, I was just essentially paid to hit people as hard as I could every single play, <laughs> which is essentially what I love to do. So it was perfect. Uh, and I've done it like that ever since I was a little kid. And um, so during my eight years in the NFL, I had seven diagnosed concussions. And uh, I always like to say, not like to say, I always say diagnosed because those are the ones I, I couldn't hide. I, I couldn't uh, shake off. I couldn't. I couldn't even function. I couldn't. Um, I couldn't function on the field. I couldn't even protect myself. So um, that's a common theme where you think, uh, and it used to be. And, and right now, the awareness piece around uh, head trauma, concussions, uh, it continues to evolve. And um, the thing about a brain injury is a, a real injury, and, and it's not something you can necessarily prove and show. And we're going to get into some of that involvement on uh, being able to push that forward, but. Being able to uh, take that and understand that it is, it is a real injury. It was something that, um, you know, looking back on now, it <laughs> leads, leads, leads me to why you guys see me in front of you here. Um, I also had, uh, during my time in the NFL, I had eight surgeries. I uh, just had my ninth surgery on my body, all across the body. So I was, I was constantly in a flux of <laughs> either uh, preparing to have a surgery or rehabilitating <laughs> from a surgery during my whole career. Um, so it gave me a different perspective as well. I was able to, um, and Kevin might, might have a, a similar uh, incident. I know he's had five surgeries, but it gives you a different perspective. If you're constantly in that state and constantly coming back and have the ability to be able to come back from that. Um, I started just being able to, to pick the mind, you know, pick the brains of the doctors, the athletic trainers, everybody around there. And so I really uh, figure out, uh, you know, everything that I needed to do to make sure I could maximize uh, my potential uh, as far as coming back from injury or, or to, uh, to keep uh, avoiding being injured at all. And, you know, really learning about things about chronic misuse of joints, of, of uh, you know, some things may or may not be unavoidable. Uh, if you think about the sport of football is built around impact and contact and um, so, some of, you know, the, the, the core of the sport, if, if, if it's built around impact, there's <laughs> Your joints can only take so much at, at the moment of impact, but um, we can talk about. I'm going to talk about that a little more. Um, so I, I retired after I retired. Well, during my time in the NFL as well, I had severe cramping issues, and I'm going to talk about this uh, as well. But you know, cramping, at, and I started that from from high school all the way through uh, college and in the NFL. But I, I guess everyone can say, "Oh, I, I've got cramping issues too." But I, I would, my whole body would lock up at times. Uh, it happened uh, several times in my career, but um, so much so that I was shipped to the Gatorade Sports Science Institute at one point uh, early on in my career, where they had to uh, really want to get a picture of how much sweat I was losing and, and the, the the composition of that sweat to understand. It. You know, I was constantly going through this guessing game on what needed to get replaced, uh, where my body was at. Uh, but, you know, really think about it as a way to gather data around my body. It was not in a real-time way, but being able to gather data around my body so I knew what I had to replace, because I, I constantly was either over-hydrating or under-hydrating, under and both of those were, were affecting performance. Um, so I, I retired uh, from the NFL in, uh, at the end of 2008, <clears throat> uh, applied to business school, got into uh, Harvard Business School, uh, as Will said, and um, during my time there, I was able to um, search out and find the company uh, MC10, which um, really the ideation and the, uh, the, the technology itself is, is a platform technology that is, was the ideation, ideation of John Rogers. Um, and it was something, after joining MC10, being able to understand the use cases, the potential use cases around sports and uh, how it could change the game in the long term were, was something that was really excited me 
Um, and it's made me start to be really uh, introspective about uh, how I looked at my career. Uh, not that I was, wasn't introspective already, but being able to understand all those different times in my career um, where I wish I had data points to guide me. And um, you start to look at the world in a different way if you're, you're able to kind of um, see a world in which there is data all around you, you can gather it and kind of set up bumpers um, to uh, give you states of readiness or fatigue or, um, you know, for me, one of my biggest things I, I talk to, <clears throat> I'll talk to uh, teams, uh, every, you know, most, mostly high school teams and college teams about, um, you know, training and then overtraining. And uh, one of my biggest things was I overtrained all the time. I didn't, it, again, it was a guessing game. I didn't know uh, when, when too much was too much, and I continued to uh, pound that home. Um, luckily, I was able to find a trainer uh, as I was preparing for the NFL draft in 2000, find a trainer that um, was able to convince me <laughs> with, all, with all his might that doing less was more uh, during certain, certain instances. So I went from working out two to three times a day, which was, I know is a little crazy, but being able to do it one, one time a day and my other workout was a stretch. And uh, you know, being able to do that was something that was, was, was eye-opening to me. Um, a, I had to trust him, which is very tough to do because I was only used to just outworking everybody. That's what my, my motto was to be able to kind of outwork, outwork, outwork. Uh, so I had to trust him at one of the most important times of my life. I wanted to play in the NFL from when I was a, a tiny, a, you know, tiny you know, nine-year-old scrawny kid. And I had to be able to trust him at that, that moment of truth in it. They ended up paying off. I, you know, for those of you that, that don't know, the kind of lead up into the NFL draft, it's, it's a series of data gathering experiments. And now, you know, from, from you know, 13 years ago to, to how it is now, it only continues to grow um, on the metrics they try to gather from, from your body. But the, the staples of, you know, 40 yard dash and um, bench press, um, all those were, you know, shell run and you know, everything they can possibly gather on you, those are still there. And, um, I was able to test better than I ever tested before. And that was not just a fluke, it ended up being because I was doing less. Um, but I was, doing, I was working out smarter. So it kind of opened up a, a level uh, of understanding within myself um, where you, you, you try to understand more around you, but you need, you need data to be able to do that. So um, I think, no, sorry. So you know, I want to talk a little bit about the, the way, you know, so, so taking that information, you know, what, I, what I've learned throughout my career, um, start to understand and think about um, this idea of a, of a performance envelope, which is you know, maximizing performance while minimizing their risk of injury. And um, you want to be able to put that work in, but not overtrain where you're, you're gonna, you're gonna lead, it's going to lead to injury. Uh, injury or put that work in where it leads to chronic misuse of joints, of muscles, of, you know, just body in general, to be able to, to break down. So, um, you know, that it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going back to this as well, right? It keeps on going back to the guessing game. You kind of never know where you're at. So being able to gather different metrics, and, and, and I'm going to go back to this as well, which is a meaningful metric uh, to, to the end user. So, so to me as an elite athlete, uh, I, I have to do something, I have to look at something, be able to measure something that's meaningful to me and something that I can take action on. And um, you know, that, I think that's one of the, the biggest pieces uh, around being able to gather data around the body. It's, it's got to be, be able to have, be something that you can, you can actually um, you know, take action on and, and make a difference in the end. So um, I'm going to get to more specific cases here in, in the end um, before, before I'm done. The, the other, the other thing is, uh, I've always, always, you know, looking back on my career and going through it, you always, as a, as a coach or a, a athletic trainer or as a doctor, you always, I would, I would talk to them and they always kind of wanted to take the pulse of the team, where the team was at, uh, readiness, fatigue, um, those, those different types of um, metrics that are, that are tough to put numbers behind and um, really kind of see the ability to be able to gather data, not just for one body, but be able to gather over a group of people to get a sense of where they were at and are they ready to play, ready to, um, ready to be the best they can possibly be. Are they, are they ready to optimize their performance? So it's a different way of looking at it as well. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, you know, in the end, this, this slide and, and the way you think about it is being able to get the most out of your body without getting injured. Uh, that's, that's kind of the, the, the gist of being able to, to look at the performance envelope. Um, so the, the other piece is being able to use conformal electronics. Uh, one, of the, one of the real benefits of this is being able to gather continuous data, uh, not episodic, but being able to gather continuous data over time, really understand um, what is happening over body, get, get not, instead of just a snapshot, but uh, being able to, imagine being able to pattern match um, each individual, because everyone's made different, uh, when that person's off their normal and, and why. And, you know, thinking about it also in a way of having catastrophe off of the past. Um, you know, a lot of the times um, being able to have warning signals of when you were off your normal, depending on the metric. You, know, you talk about muscle activity, heart rate, uh, EKG, EEG. You, know, you talk about different metrics you can start to look at. You, you start to see how that could be very, very beneficial. Um, and by the way, you know, going back to this, this, this other slide, this is you know, this is something that, you know, as an elite athlete, you're gonna have, you're gonna be able to be exposed, uh, exposed to if you really wanna put up with it. And most of the times the, the devices are clunky and rigid and you're willing to put up with it. But um, being able to put this in a way that you can have the seamless sensing experiences is, 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 the, is the key. And that's really kind of where the, the benefit of using the, uh, the conformal electronics comes in. So this is some of the, the uh, the research that we've done at MC10, a lot of that is uh, mirrored to a lot of what has been done in this room. And, um, really, you know, I, I think a lot of this, um, the research, uh, the, the body conditions you grow on a lot of this, um, it's the different metrics around this as well. Um, you know, the, the metrics that end up meaning something in the end, uh, in the use case around it. So, you know, for example, we've done a lot of work of, uh, you know, looking at muscle activity and trying to tie that in on something that's going to mean something to the end user. If you start to <clears throat> start to think about each of these, uh, each of these pot as a possibility to, to measure something, but what's it going to mean to the end user? It becomes a little different and a little. It adds a twist to the puzzle, right? So even if you are successful being able to do that, you want it to uh, really have it mean something to the end user. So. You know, for, for muscle activity, we've really uh, been able to look at different ways how that could mean something to end users. So being able to tie m uh, motion to muscle activation, for example, uh, is a way to put a quantitative metric around coming back from an injury, right? So, um, you know, I don't know if anybody, I'm sure people have been injured in the room and you go through this rehabilitation process and always, you know, I was, like I said, I was constantly in that in that mode coming, coming back from an injury, um, coming back from a surgery. And it was always a very qualitative process. Well, you know, you seem like you're okay to come back. You, know, you seem like you're testing okay, you could be okay. But imagine being able to put a quantitative number on that and how you compare uh, to both sides of your body, um, and depending on, you know, on the muscle part or the, you know, the different part of your body. Uh, tying accelerometry to muscle activity to give you a true sense of how close you are to coming back to what your normal was if, if you're a benchmark. So uh, the use cases around all of these can really can really open up to gathering this, this data that's out there, but being able to do it in a way that um, each person could be, can have their, I mean, if you think about it, they have their own personal coach in some way where it's guiding them uh, during, their, during their time away from the team and as well as this collective unit of, of data that gives you, uh, or a, a coach or an athletic trainer or a doctor, this, this collective pulse of the team of where you're at. And to make the unit stronger and each individual stronger in that team. So you start to see how this could make a huge difference, uh, you know, two teams and, um, you know, you, you could really start to think about all the use cases around this. Um, you know, true measures of activity true measures of functional motion, so being able to really gather these metrics while you're actually going through the, the actual functional, you know, so for me, I was a football player, being able to take those uh, numbers and, and gather that data while I was actually doing the actual, the actual exercises is, is gonna be important and, and understand how that, that changed over time. Um, so, I mean, it's going back, this is kind of just, uh, you know, a way to, 
think uh, think about um, the you know the, the non-invasive way, the, se the seamless sensing approach, being able to put it on and forget about it, and, and you're able to get, gather this um, data over time, just just based on sheer compliance, right? You're, you're able to put it on and forget about it, um, and and kind of give you this ability to when you are off your normal, right? You pattern match when you're off your normal based on whatever metric you're talking about and be able to kind of do that. Um, this is kind of, uh, you know, a slide just based on, um, you know, kind of the, the process, but, you know, this really puts a picture to the words that I'm talking about and being able to gather this data that gives you this continuous feedback loop on, and putting these bumpers up on, on how you can approach everyday, everyday life, everyday living, everyday activity. Uh, and in a way that's it's it's not like it's not like a it's not a way where you have to just put up with it. It's a it's a way where it's going to ex accentuate what you do every single day. Um, so we've been, been able to uh, really think about different ways to use uh, this conformal uh, technology. Um, the the top right is the first instantiation of uh, a uh, packaging. Uh, electronics in a way that is more of a spirit of the technology, right? So being able to package electronics in a way that have not been packaged before and be able to take a measure that is tightly coupled to the head to give you a, a measure of force of impact. Which brings me to, um, you know, our, our first case. So we, we recently just launched um, a check light system, uh, MC10, which uh, closely developed um, with Reebok, we embedded our electronics into a skull cap to measure force of impact and go into that a little more. But I want to talk about the, uh, sorry. So concussions overall um, have garnered a lot of popular press, have gotten a lot of attention and uh, for very good reason, right? Uh, the game has changed, the data, the body of data continues to grow around uh, around uh, repetitive head trauma and um, you know the the repetitive repetitive head head trauma in the use cases and looking at the the brain's postmortem of, of athletes uh, continues to grow and um, the disease chronic traumatic, chronic traumatic encephalopathy um, is the the is the disease you talk about from this repetitive head trauma and we're going to be able to, I'm going to talk about that a little more as well um, but you know for me it's um, you know looking back it, it goes back to uh, you know how much the sport meant to me and um, the solution is not getting rid of contact sports in general the solution is playing them in a safer way and I think um, that was really my motivation for being able to get involved in them and being able to to change uh, you know how, how this is thought of so um, I'm you know just going back into my own personal piece, um, during my undergrad years at Harvard, my roommate was, uh, was Chris Nowinski, who's a, a thought leader in the United States uh, on head trauma, on awareness. He founded Sports Legacy Institute uh, and then partnered up with, as the, as the awareness arm, and partnered up with Boston University uh, School of Medicine for the awareness piece. So being able to look at brains postmortem to look for uh, this tau protein buildup in the brain uh, from repetitive head trauma. They now have, you know, over um, over 80 percent of the the amount of brains looked at for this disease in the world uh, there. Um, but <laughs> Chris has a, quite a winding path. I can spend a lot of time talking about him. But um, like I said, he was my roommate in college. Uh, he went on. <laughs> so I went to the NFL, and he went on to uh, wrestle at WWE. Uh, which is your typical pass of two Harvard guys. Uh, <laughs> so that was, we used to always joke around about it. I remember sitting in the front row, um, his third year, uh, his third year when he was wrestling in the WWE, it was Monday Night Raw. At Madison Square Garden, I remember sitting in the front row, I'm like, how the hell did this happen? This <laughs> <laughs> my third year in the NFL. Third year uh, in WWE. And, um, and by the way, his character was called Chris Harvard. He played a pompous jerk. <laughs> <laughs> he played a pompous jerk from the Ivy League, which he did perfectly. He's the nicest guy in the world, though, but he, he really is a good actor. Um, so it was, it was, uh, that, that piece is funny. But, so he, his career ended up getting cut, cut short. Um, he got kicked off, off of a ladder <clears throat> his third year. Uh, he was wrestling um, by, the, by the Dudley boys. I don't know if there's any wrestling fans in here. But I <laughs> got kicked off the top ladder, uh, ended up getting a concussion, was 
was not himself for for a complete year. Uh, so much so where I, you know, being his I'm his best man at his wedding coming up here soon. But I was really worried about him. Uh, I had to really watch out. Spent a lot of time with him. The more he he had to deal with it, the more he started to research about this. I ended up writing a book on uh, on concussions and head trauma in in the NFL and in the United States. And has since become a thought leader for this for this cause. Um, Again, he's talking about Boston University being able to actually tie those two together. And uh, he's really driven this forward. I, I sit on the board of directors of, of Sports Legacy Institute. It's obviously a nonprofit, but uh, again, something near and dear to my heart and something that uh, has really caused a lot of, um, of the research to continue to grow, continue to build. Uh, the NFL donated uh, dollars for research to Sports Legacy and Boston University two years ago, and they continue to add money to that. So. It's been a great cause, and uh, we'll continue to push forward on that. Uh, this is instantiation right here. You see uh, the doctors at uh, Boston University, Dr. Stern, uh, Dr. Anna Key, who's the, the, one of the four, uh, foremost uh, experts on looking at and dissecting brains, uh, post-mortem looking through this disease. It's very similar um, to, uh, I guess, somewhere pathologically uh, to uh, Alzheimer's disease, and she's an expert on being able to tell differentiate between both of those. And this is Dr. Cantu, who's kind of the godfather of head trauma, concussion awareness in uh, in the United States. Been been in the game for 35 years and was pounding this drum a long time ago. And this is Chris Nowinski back here, uh, looking looking on. Um, I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quickly. I'm running a little behind here, but um, you know, I just want to. You know, to talk about you know why does this matter to everybody in here? Um, you know, everybody knows uh, how many there's a, there's a large amount of people in the United States and across the world that play contact sports. This isn't just a football thing. This is it's an all sports uh, thing. And you talk about limiting uh, head exposure, in, impact exposure to the head over time. Is it just it makes sense to a lot of people, right? And um, it probably shouldn't have taken this much evidence to have to grow to convince a lot of people. But uh, here we sit <laughs> with it, with this going on. Um, I would not call this a bad thing. So, um, you talk this. I wanted to kind of really show you. There's there's different reasons uh, across levels of play. You know, you can go from the youth youth game, uh, whatever, whatever again, whatever sport, but youth to high school to college, the NFL, and you'll see a lot of these are, are very similar um, on the reasons why they, why they didn't, didn't report. Um, and there's different motivation behind it all. But I mean, there's this. There is, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but there's an emotional investment of why, why they're out there, and there's emotional investment at whatever level you play uh, on kind of you had your spot in the field, not wanting to let your teammates down, which is, um, you know, that, that kind of cuts across every single level of sport. Um, so, I mean, this is, you know, this is a work with, oh, sorry, work with SLI, and, um, you know, being able to, um, you, know, you identify the problem and, and really understand how, how you're going to do something, what are you, you going to do about, it, about this? And this is one of the reasons I got involved um, around the check light and being able to uh, make, a, make a positive impact. And you know, I, have, I have a nine-year-old son myself, uh, nine, uh, Isaiah Jr., and I want him to play the sport, like I said, and he's got to do it. He's got to play a different game than the game I played, and it's got, it's got to be a safer game. I want to do something to, to be able to help that. I was sick of People are kind of always really kind of pointing to that problem, and um, you know, no, no one ever offering a solution. I want to be someone that offered a solution somehow to make the game safer and reinforce safe technique. Um, so I, this is <laughs> there's a question I would say yes to, and um, there's a lot of reasons for that. But you know, being able to kind of gather data right now, and obviously this is only going to continue to grow. Technology is. Uh, is, is inevitable. It's going to have its place in sports, and uh, from from elite sports all the way down to the weekend warrior and fitness sports and fitness in general, it's it's going there. Um, so you know, one of the you know the kind of case studies that I'm going to focus on obviously is going to be um, around uh, head trauma. How you how we can talk about this? How you can change behavior in such a way um, around that? One or two. Um, you know, talk about uh, the technology and how, how, how we can make a difference in, in the head trauma space. Um, so when I thought about this, we, we learned a lot, learned a ton, um, but you know, took a step back as you develop a product, 
Uh, the first thing you want to be able to think about is there's a couple things you just got to get out of the way. It's not a diagnostic tool. You can't. I don't think anybody's ever going to have a diagnostic tool per se based on your level of impact. So if someone says they have your magic number uh, or you know, there's the magic number of concussions, I think it's, it's always going to be um, a step ahead. It's, it's, uh, I, I think I, I liken it when I talk about uh, if you look at heart rate or EKG, um, there's some targets of areas you want to stay out of, but nothing's, nothing's magic that you, you want to do. So being able to kind of put bumpers up around that. Um, that being said, um, you know, you want to be able to have that, that teaching tool, right? So being able to understand and give you kind of a slap on the wrist when your head is in impact. And um, the check light system works in a system of uh, complex measurements uh, through sensors, uh, you know, like 3X accelerometer and gyroscope, measuring the location of the impact on the head and the duration of that impact. But being able to tell you when to keep, take that complex measurement and bend it into an actionable item at the end, when to, remind you when to keep your head out of impact. It's not going to diagnose anything, but it, it, it continues to remind you, the athlete, from, from any age group across any sport, right? Um, another, another thing is being able to take, take the objective measure out of, out of the athlete's hands, uh, not, not leaving it up to, to the athlete himself. I was, I was in there, uh, Kevin was in there. I mean, anybody who's in there has ever had any type of, uh, played a sport or had any type of a hit to the head, you, you, you're always going to say you're fine. I was always going to say I'm fine no matter what, what age I was at. Um, but this, the light system goes off when, when, it's re, when it is identified as significant impact and um, when, that, when that triggers, it puts you on that pathway to assessment. So it takes it out of that player's hands, take the pride issue out of it as well. It, it, it brings you a level of accountability um, that is just did, did not exist as well. It, um, the check light system be able to log impacts over time. Um, and understand how you can start to ration out and save your impacts. Why would you waste your impacts in a practice? Um, whereas, you know, if I look back on my, my career, I would say 90% of my total impact exposure came in practice. Like, why? I mean, I, I'll talk to people like, there's no, there's no reason for me to look, you know, just practice hitting myself on my head on the wall to be really good at it. I don't have to do that, right? <laughs> so I, I, I can take my word for it in the game, but being able to kind of practice for that in a fast way without contact should be absolutely, um, absolutely encouraged. Uh, you know, so I think changing behavior over the long term and how, how uh, doctors, athletic trainers, coaches look at the game and how they um, save, uh, save these impacts and save kind of total exposure during, during, um, during games. Um, so you would be able to kind of get this true impact exposure if you're able to log impacts over time as well. Um, and then going back to, you want, you want this actionable and uh, into something that is digestible uh, to the end user where they can, they know uh, they put them on a pathway to do something on whatever metric you give them. And then you being able to use it across all sports, right? So being able to uh, not just tie sensors to a piece of equipment, but tie them to something to, that you can use across any sport, any activity, was, was one of the other issues. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed up through this, but I want to show this. This, go, this goes on in America frequently. This is a youth football practice. And you talk about, you know, if, if my son, little Isaiah, goes out to practice, um, I, want, I want some level of accountability that I know what happened to him. I don't want five severe impacts like this going on every time. So this, that makes me sick every time I see it. And, but it's also a, a great motivator for me. So I want to I make sure that does not happen to my son, little Isaiah. And obviously, I, I'm a little different. I'd, I'd coach my son's team when he does play. But, um, <laughs> but that, that happens every single day, right? So you want to be able you don't, who wants someone exposed to that? But the solution is not taken away in my, in my mind at all. Um, so it, it, this goes back to the problem with youth sports in general. A lot of this can't be. Uh, a, lot of, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of this, a lot of people just don't know. So on, on the youth youth sports sidelines, there are no athletic trainers. Um, there's close to well, I should say I shouldn't say any. I would say 98 percent of the youth practices and games across all sports, there's no athletic trainer, there's no doctor. And that's pretty scary if you're thinking about your, exposing your, your kids to that every single day. You do have kids. 
Um, then you talk about lack of concussion training, awareness, the whole, the whole piece. So, you know, being able to have a system where you have an extra set of eyes on the athlete is, is something that that's brings up, again, it brings in the level of accountability. Um, and then, you know, you, you, if, you, if you're talking about the, the youth, youth phase of the game um, across sports, you know, children are young, they're not going to understand how to, you know, you, there's, there's issues as you get older, right? But the children, even more so, are not going to be able to understand what a significant impact is and, and what to deal with that, identify symptoms as well. And then you, you talk about, uh, you talk about what's important and, and protecting what is important. Um, you know, I always talk about the idea of, of having a hit count or um, an impact count for the head, which is, you know, the, the checklight system logs impacts. Um, being able to have a hit count in baseball, if you care that much about someone's elbow, why wouldn't you, if you have the technology available, why would you measure what, how many times they're hitting the head? And, and it becomes a very simple argument that way. Um, I'll go through this, I apologize, I'm running super behind, sorry Kevin. Um, so I'm gonna blow through this. So this is the, the check light. I, I'm more than happy to talk about this, but you talk about the evolution of, um, of different uh, athletic equipment, how it's, it's evolved over the game. Um, being able to have that evolve, being able to change and gather data around your body. Um, the idea, this is a real picture by the way, um, you know, being able to see real injury and not see real injury. And, and you know, you can't see, you know, like a broken bone or a dis something disjointed like this, um, not be able to see that. So, you know, concussion just has to be treated differently, right? To have an objective measure is, is unbelievably important for us. So this is the actual uh, Reebok product. We, we launched uh, officially almost three weeks ago and um, excited, to, you know, over three years of development, over uh, seven rounds of field testing, over 15,000 drop tests in the lab iterating back and forth and uh, through a light system for this, being able to bend significant impact through a, a really, really uh, complex measurement, proprietary algorithm uh, that was, was honed in the field across sports. So from football to ice hockey to lacrosse to rugby to soccer to basketball to baseball uh, to field hockey, we tested it all across age, gender, and uh, in sport. Um, this is an up-close view, but you know, being able to have the uh, the significant impact bend here, a very complex uh, calculation where you're not just spitting out tons of data, you're spitting out data and synthesizing it and get, giving it in an actionable way at the end. Um, this is kind of the feedback loop that we talked about with the objective measure, uh, extra set of eyes of, on, on each athlete, um, kind of elite level resources that you're able to bring down through the high school, you know, college, high school, and uh, youth level across sports. Uh, you know, some of, the, some of the big things are, you know, as, as I, I run the sports business at, at MC10, be able to kind of uh, focus on those and, um, you know, just the takeaways from, for me is, you know, being able to have the, the match, I know I'm going to pound this home, sorry, but having, having an actionable, uh, the ability to be able to change behavior, so not developing technology for technology's sake, but uh, how can I change your behavior from what you were doing to make it either safer or maximize performance, and then just having the, the, the metric in the end meaningful to the end user. So all three of those kind of the elixir for uh, you know how we develop and how we, we push forward in the sports segment for MC10 and the, the use cases. So with that, I'll give it to Kevin. Sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Come on, I like Isaiah. I'm gonna take a seat here. I have bad knees, according to my doctors around here. Very well. Like, so. <laughs> um. So. But well, I'm gonna just give you a brief overview of what we're doing here. Can everybody hear me very well, first off? If you can't back there, let me know. I'll just give you a brief overview of what we're doing here as part of a, a big group overall. Um, our group is a very small part of a bigger group that we're looking at. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of hypothermia and sports as it relates to, we're gonna talk about concussions here. Uh, a, a brief background of uh, hypothermia, and then talk about a selective head cooling that we're gonna use. As Isaiah was just mentioning here, uh, concussions are, are very hard to determine, very hard to look at, and very hard to, to be able to see. Uh, 20 years ago when I was playing, a long time ago, I didn't know what a concussion really was. Uh, as an athlete, you know, you were told loss of conscience was the main thing that you were told was a concussion. We're now starting to see that that's not the only thing that's a problem. You know, there's short-term as well as long-term complications when you have a concussion. 
So when I started getting into research, what I was concerned with, as you can see here, it's not the big picture here to, to overall look at, but what I'm concerned with is there's a, a cascade of events that happens with concussion. It's a multifactorial problem that happens in the head. So you can't just pinpoint and look at one aspect. You want to look at multiple aspects that we're looking at here. The one thing that's not really pictured on here is what we talk about in our research lab is temperature. Um, temperature is a very useful body sign. To, uh, if you go to the doctor most times, you'll be told to you know, take your temperature from that point. When we talk about it in athletics, we're talking about hypothermia. And hypothermia is very prevalent. Obviously, you have to work your body out. You have to sweat and do some of the things. So we look at the pathology of, of uh, interest of uh, hyperthermia in athletics. As an athlete wearing football gear, you, know, you can get your brain temperature elevated pretty high. Um, as you can see here, research, uh, research in animals is starting to show that if you gave a uh, hyperthermia experience to a rat before you gave a head injury to the rat, it worsens the conditions of the rat. So obviously temperature is playing a very critical role when we start thinking about it in, in terms of concussions and head injuries. How does hyperthermia and concussions uh, play the same role? Um, as an athlete, we've always been seeing that you know, you're dehydrated, you're okay. But there's a lot of the symptoms that overlap with hyper, uh, hyperthermia and concussions, um, where if you get you know, nausea, you get dizziness, you get fatigue, you get athletes who have blurred vision, some of the same problems they have with concussions. So as an tr athletic trainer, how do you distinguish between the, the two? And so what we're interested in is, could our cooling part be a part of being able to help some of these things? Um, as Isaiah was talking about dehydration, um, obviously increase the dehydration increases the athlete's ability to, uh, athlete's chances of getting the concussion. I know I'm flying through these slides pretty fast here, huh? Uh, so where did, where did we go from here? Uh, when I started working with John Wong, and I don't know if he's in here today, uh, oh, he's way back there. Uh, we were interested in a lot of things. John has no, if you talk to him, no real sports background. And we started talking about things, uh, dealing with the cooling helmet as a military aspect for blast injury. Uh, we got to talking about icing as athletes. We sit in hot tubs, I mean, cold tubs. And he, was, he thought that was pretty shocking. Uh, but that's something that's a routine practice in athletics. You're told most of the time, if you, you're hurt, put ice on it. Um, and then we start thinking about what you're normally told for most athletic trainers is rest, ice, compression, uh, elevation are the main two things we're really told a lot. Uh, if you think about the middle two, ice and compression, uh, there'll be a verbal recall to that in a minute here in a second as I keep going on for neuroscientists out there. I know a lot of them are probably looking at me like I'm crazy. Uh, what we were interested in is could cooling help mitigate, you know, mitigate some of the problems or complications that are associated with uh, traumatic brain injuries or concussions. So what I'm going to give you is a brief overview of systemic cooling, and then uh, a little bit of background of selective head cooling overall. When we talk about systemic cooling, uh, we're talking about the most potent neuroprotecting intervention in laboratory studies and, and animal studies. In the clinical aspect of it, you have, uh, they have shown that it could be very useful in uh, brain injury due to cardiac arrest. And neonates, it's also uh, shown that it's been very useful in uh, helping neonates in encephalopathy. encephalopathy. I can never say that word, so don't forgive me for that, that part there. Um, there's also a systemic approach to accomplish regional hyperthermia has yet to yield an effective uh, intervention strategy in TBI. Um, whole body cooling is shown to have a lot of complications associated with it. When we think about it from the athletic point of view, um, having an ice tub on the athletic field would be kind of hard to do you know, every game, every situation. Uh, given intravenous uh, blood injections or cooling blood to the body on the sidelines can be pretty hard to do. So using a systemic cooling system would be kind of hard to do in the athletic world. When we start, start thinking about selective brain cooling overall, it uh, may represent the most ideal strategy to provide therapeutic benefits to, uh, intended to the target organ, i.e. the brain. Um, some of the work that John has shown in, uh, in previous stuff is that you can bring the brain temperature down while keeping the body at a normal thermic state, which is, is more beneficial to the, to the brain. Um, it avoids physiological responses that you will see with systemic cooling, so hopefully the, the complications that you see with systemic, systemic cooling you will not see with the whole body, uh, with selective head cooling, and maybe the most practical approach uh, of dealing with uh, brain injury or concussions overall. This is the cooling helmet here. Um, it's developed by Wilkins, by Bill Elkins. Uh, it's a non-invasive, easy to operate, and FDA cleared thing. Another point we can put up is we finally got IRB approval. If anybody knows IRB process, it wasn't an easy thing to do here. Um, this is the, the genius idea of uh, Bill Elkins. Um, 
who's uh, known as one of the fathers of the spacesuits design. He developed cooling systems for, for microenvironments for spacesuits, and he took that technology and wanted to develop cooling ther thermal therapies uh, back in about 2002, 2004. Um, what he did with that is develop cooling therapy um, in a system called Game Ready. This is one of the first products that looks that they looked at that did <coughs> deep tissue thermal therapy, which involves ice and compression. Um, this is mostly seen in most athletic training rooms. If you've uh, if you've ever been in an athletic training room, um, they have body they have uh, different things for different body parts. Obviously, shoulder and arm. They have some for hand. They have. And so you can start seeing that this ice, this compression is very critical to be able to deliver uh, thermal therapies to athletics. When we start thinking about the cooling helmet of it, um, as you can see here, it's designed to be able to deliver cold, cold saline, cold water, while removing, so basically having a heat exchange uh, between the two. Um, let me get this up here. So what we want to have is a direct contact with the scalp, with direct contact with the head. You get a flow of the liquid going through. Um, after that, you'll get to the uh, pressure. And then what you want to have is, is a, a heat exchange between the brain as well as the, the uh, device that we're using. Um, what we're doing now for projects that we're working on. So where are we at with our projects here? Um, we're working on MRI, uh, looking at what parts of the brain are being cooled, um, looking at blood flow changes in the brain. Um, another pilot safety study that we're working on is looking at uh, feasibility of, does your heart rate change, does your blood pressure change, does respiratory rate change, and normal volunteers with no head injuries, being able to show proof of concept that this, this technology does work. Um, future projects that we're interested in looking into is developing, as he was talking about before, repetitive cooling protocol um, that we can use pre and post injury. Um, looking at, as Isaiah talked about, adolescents, looking at kids and being able to develop a protocol that can be used at a later state. Um, as well as, uh, like I said, I told you before, our project is a part of a bigger project overall for this campus, uh, developing assessment and possible intervention protocols that looks at hydration and looks at neurocognition, neuroimaging, and biomarkers. Um, and then on the end of that, I'll end with this right here. I work with, you know, a lot of teams I've played with in my life, but I think I'm working with some of the best, you know, brains in the world in this lab right now, in, in this group right here. Well, we're trying to, you know, answer some of the questions that we're interested in too. As a neurocognition team with Dr. Cohen and Dr. Kramer, uh, looking at imaging from Brad Sutton's group, um, and then our, our group adding the thermal therapy. So we're trying not just to look at it for one aspect, we're trying to look at it from uh, multiple ways of trying to isolate what's happening with concussion and if cooling therapy or other intervention technologies can be used to help deal with that. And with that, I'll end my talk and we can answer any questions that you may have. So I'll open the floor to questions. Say so it again. What temperature differential can you achieve in the brain tissue? How far, how cool can we get it? Yeah, uh, that lies with Uh fact is we can't really measure brain temperature. We can look at more of the core. Uh, we can't really tell you how it can win. That's the part of the MRI thermometry part of it that we're working on, is being able to tell how cool the brain does get using that technology. Um, we can drop probably about 25 degree core temperature I don't know how that relates to the brain as far as when we don't have a way to actually put a probe in and actually look at it. I think the work that John has done before in the paper that they, they can get down to about two degrees, but the probe in an unsedated person, an insedated person, uh, they can get around two degrees, uh, drop it about two degrees overall. Is that correct, John? I mean, you know better than I would. Um, it, does, it does create a differential cooling because, you know, by the mechanisms from surface down to the core, so the core of the brain, on average, is about 0.5 degrees Celsius higher than the core temperature. So the core of the brain is where the thalamus is, the hypothalamus sits. So the hypothalamus is the sensor for the brain temperature, gets plenty of blood flow, uh, rapidly sampling the body temperature and adjust, adjusting the body temperatures. The core of the brain is about 0.5 degrees Celsius higher than the core of the body. So when you have a surface cooling mechanism applied to the top 
over the scalp, then it has a differential cooling. So the surface of the brain is rapidly cooled, but the core of the brain is not as much cooled. So that's the limitation of the technology. So any deep structures, such as the limbic system and et cetera, resides in the deep center of the brain, then it does not get readily affected. Or the hippocampus and the things that's folded into the depth of the brain are, are conceptually difficult to be affected by this technology rapidly. But it does eventually affect your core temperature. So for example, for us, last night we just did cooling. Actually, I was, uh, you know, uh, the, the person who's in the MRI getting the cooling, the core temperature will drop half a degree to, to, to one degree. Um, so it's pretty routine to drop one degree Fahrenheit or half a degree Celsius to one degree Celsius throughout the cooling period for 20 to 30 minutes. So you do achieve some systemic cooling because the cardiac output, 20%, goes to the head. So that 20% is being actively cooled off by extraction of the heat. But the surface cooling is much more profound. And the surface where the cortex, where, the, where your gray matter is, where the neurons reside, then gets the most effect. So conceptually, surface injury on the cortex um, can be potentially more protected by the technology than deep injuries, such as brain stem, thalamic injuries, et cetera. And then a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, the white matter tracks, uh, corpus callosum, you know, diffuse axonal injury, those injuries are uh, affecting the deeper white matter that conceptually are harder to be addressed by this technology. So it's not meant to be exclusive, it's meant to be complementary. So in the field, you can apply this accomplished rapid surface cooling, then once you get to definitive facility, a uh, hospital or from a military setting, fly to into a di different area, then you can start systemic cooling to achieve cooling from inside out. Then that, that's how you can have a uniform cooling field. But, but, but you can accomplish two degrees Celsius drop of surface brain temperature within 20 minutes. So has this been tested I mean, in terms of any effectiveness for concussion, let's say, so right after a traumatic impact on the head, I mean, is, that, has, is there any sort of data that this is uh, beneficial, uh, immediate application of this, of this cooling device, that it, uh, it's immediate lowering of the temperature of the, you know, the cerebral um, cortex? We didn't hear the question up here. I didn't know if you were referring to John or you were referring to us. The question a little more effective. Uh, I was wondering if this uh, if this data that has shown that this is effective in let's say if, uh, immediately after an impact, let's say in sports, uh, a severe blow to the head, that this is that there is a beneficial effect in terms of if you apply this immediately and cool the uh, um, the surface of the of the brain, and this is perhaps also the area that's most impacted in, in concussions. Uh, this is uh, is there evidence that this is uh, beneficial in the immediate application? Uh, we haven't tested it yet, yet, but we would think that some of the stuff that they've shown so far, which is hyper selective hypothermia, that you do get a brain reduction. What we hope to do is deal with some of the secondary effects that occur, occur from, hyper, uh, from a concussion overall. Um, but we don't know the proof of concept yet. We don't know how well it will work. We need to understand how the brain handles temperature overall, cooling it. And that's why we're doing some of the safety studies and MRI studies to see what happens with the brain. I, I, I want to put words in your mouth, but eventually be able to, to answer the first part of your question, to be able to tie impact to what you see with MRI to cooling as well. Well, actually, uh, this question is a little bit more complicated. There's uh, different layers of obstacles. The first question is identification of the problem. So as you two gentlemen have already discovered, uh, discussed that first is to identify concussion and stratify the severity. We don't have a standard way of doing that. So as long as you don't have a standard way of identifying the injury and stratifying the severity of the injury in a standard fashion, then it's very difficult to study how you're going to help with that. So that's one problem. Second problem is how do you evaluate how well your players, athletes, military personnel, civilian injury, a brain injury person are doing? What's, what, what criteria are you using? Uh, it, you know, certainly it's easier when you have severe injury, penetrating injury, you know, you say, oh, you're in nursing home drooling, that's bad. Uh, but, but you're holding a job, that's good. But a lot of times when you are looking at concussion, we're talking about 80% of majority of the head trauma, how are you going to stratify the outcome? 
And that's another question. So neural cognition become the cornerstone of that particular stratification. But even with neural cognition, which domain is going to be prominently affected? Now, we know of several domains. But we're using what specific assessment tests to follow the outcome. So as long as these, so these areas all need to be advanced in parallel before we can say, OK, let's say this therapy is going to help. Help what? Identify the problem precisely. And how do you help? Assess the outcome precisely. So we're not there yet. So right now, it's a nice concept. In animal studies, it has demonstrated that hypothermia, heat hurts. That's well established. So then you say intuitively, if I can reduce that heat-induced injury, I can potentially help. That's all we've got. If you're talking about clinically head trauma and stroke, do you uh, have better outcome by cooling the body down? That's all we have. The answer is no. The data is no. And that's been proven multiple times through multi center uh, 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 randomized study. But the cooling is never prompt. Because how are you going to drop the systemic temperature drastically in the field? You're going to cool your athletes in the field, drop their core temperature. That's going to cause arrhythmia, a lot of problems, bleeding potentials. So we're hoping to come up with a way that would advance brain cooling without compromise systemic issues and transfer the patient to a definitive facility to apply systemic cooling. So unless you combine the two, it's very hard to design a therapeutic strategy. So those are the sort of the layered, compli uh, you know, sort of obstacles. I have a question about the Reebok helmet. How much does it cost, A? And B, uh, is there a way to connect it to a computer and download the data so you can do your own studies or something? Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a skull cap. So it embedded the electronics in a skull cap. So we, uh, we, we didn't choose to go, you know, to embed the, the sensors into uh, a helmet or uh, anything else uh, on purpose. So part of that was the multi-sport aspects of it. Uh, it's $150 retail. Um, which is, you know, if you look at the uh, what is out there, you, know, you look at a Rydell hit system. I mean, it's almost fifty thousand dollars to outfit a team uh, to gather that type of data. Well, it's cheaper than shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So, but yeah, like the, the other the other uh, options are you can get quite expensive, um, and then the. The short answer to your, your next question, you, you're able to gather data off of the device. Um, it has a micro USB, be able to gather data off the device um, visually uh, through a, light, a series of light systems that is able to continue to log impacts over X amount of time. So um, if I want to find out what happened in one practice, I'm able to see how many lights were triggered, so how many severe impacts. Or if you want to go over a, a, a period of time from a season so from sport, so from football, say to ice hockey, lacrosse, be able to have that total impact exposure over that time, you'll be able, it'll be able to continue to log and be able to pull that data off of that in a visual way. Okay, so I'm going to let myself ask the last question. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I really took from your, 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 your discussion today was the notion that a lot of this head trauma happens during practice. And I know at the, at least at the professional level, they really have, through their collective bargaining agreement, instituted work rules that limits the amount of contact, for example, that they have during the week of practice. Has those kinds of notions started to filter down, both to college and then to high school football, in terms of limiting the amount of contact during the week? Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm sure Kevin's going to add to this as well. I mean, there's, uh, yeah, so I think it just makes sense um, to a lot of people, especially with. with data continue to gather that limiting exposure during practice just makes sense. So uh, Chris Nowinski has been a, a huge proponent of, of being able to limit what we is in our reach to be able to limit. And um, starting with the NFL, and then it's, it's now trickling down to colleges. Uh, it's, all, it's already been implemented in the youth leagues uh, across sports uh, in the U.S., high schools as well. Uh, I think the Big Ten just undertook a couple of big initiatives, the Ivy League, has limited contact. You can't have more than two days of contact per week. Um, they did that last year, beginning of last year, uh, instituted that. And there's a series, the SEC is implementing stuff this year, the Big Ten's implementing a whole series of changes this year as well. 
Uh, and it goes back to the same notion, right? You don't have to practice hitting your head against the wall to get really good at it. Uh, you know, and quite honestly, the solution to that, being able to keep your head out of impact all the way around, but um, that's going to take time to be able to kind of teach safe technique, and everybody wants to do that and reinforce it some way, but it's going to take some time to, to change. And quite honestly, this is a very subtle change in how the, you're going to want to play the game itself. I mean, you know, I, I go back to when I, when I started playing football, I, I first started playing you know, organized football in seventh grade. And, and uh, from the very first snap of it until I, the, my last snap in the NFL, on defense, when I, learned, I wanted to hit someone as hard as I could every single play. And I had the same mentality. It was just like, it's just drilled into you. You didn't even think about it anymore by the, by the time <laughs> by the time you're out of high school, you, instead of a very subtle, whoever has the ball, I want to bring him to the ground. It's, it's a huge difference, but it's like, all right, well, I, that could probably make the game safer too, right? So it's, 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 it's just a, a changing mentality o over time, and it's all going to change with awareness and, and being able to have teaching tools around to, to be able to kind of change that mentality. And a lot of it's a different aspect of respect and, and understanding uh, what you're doing to your body for the long run too. So. I mean, to, to add to that, I think a lot of teams are starting to take, you know, notice of this. Um, they'll be do, they're doing practices without helmets now, you know, because a lot of players, you, you wear shells, you wear helmets. If you take the helmet away, you won't use your head. So a lot of people are taking away playing with practice with helmets on because a lot of things you want to do, like you just said, you want to hit somebody. With the helmet on, you think you're, you're, you're okay, you think you won't get hurt. Uh, so taking the helmet away, you'll stop using your head that way. So that's what they're doing in a lot of practices now. Well, let's thank our speakers again.